I see some familiar faces out there for those of you that are new. My name is Lisa Snitzer. I am a lead building attendant here at the Summit on the Park. And my job is I, I work to help coordinate with all the other uh, Summit staff for day-to-day -day, uh, room operations and helping out with the day-to-day -day scheduling at the Summit. And today you are attending as part of your training the annual department staff training. And that is a requirement for all Canton Leisure Service staff employees. Um, this is going to be a little lengthy of a program. Um, we will take a five minute break about halfway through. That way it gives you a break and me a break. So we're going to go ahead and get started. All week you guys have been doing various different types of training. Uh, Canton Leisure Service staff are required to complete pre-employment requirements, which you have done because you are already here. However, every year you have to undergo GCN training. Those are the training videos that you viewed. And each year we complete those by June 30th. We also have annual department training, which we are doing right now. And then you also may receive job specific training and certifications for your specific area, whether you're working with camps, youth, summit, therapeutic rec, you'll get specific training for your work area. Right here we have a training agenda, it's kind of basic map, and a training agenda is an umbrella that can include things such as department updates, Canton Leisure Service emergency procedures, which we will cover today, human resource topics, and general customer service information. Right here we have a nice picture collage of our various properties around Canton Leisure Services, uh, some of which you know you will see throughout the summer. Who we are and who we serve. You are working for Canton Township and we provide services to at least 93,000 Canton residents and that number is growing. We are a growing community. The Leisure Services Department includes the following. Administrative support services, our administration building, our parks, trails, and sports, facility maintenance, our cable services, such as our cable studio that we have, our golf courses, our performing arts, such as the Cherry Hill Village Theater, the Summit on the Park, the Block Youth and Teen Center, and various recreational classes, programs, camps, and events. Right there we see a picture of a ribbon cutting of the expansion of the Rouge River Trail system that was um, added last year in 2014. Who do we serve? As Canton Township employees, we serve, again, at least 93,000 uh, residents around the community. And here are some statistics for you. About 40,000 of the households have children in them. And overall, generally, 51% of the population is female, with the median or average age being 37. And it is uh, projected that 55 to 70 year old people will see the largest increase. So in other words, Canton population will be having more and more seniors. It is projected to th for that to increase by 2019, so within the next five years. And then they also project that we will see an increase of multi-generational households, such as not only you may be residing with your parents, but you may also have other generations, such as grandparents, that may come and live with you too. That's, that's a, just a general trend that they are reporting. And we also serve price-sensitive consumers. People are coming to the Canton community, they're coming to the summit, they're taking, care, taking part in our parks and programs, and they're looking for good value. So they are price-sensitive consumers. Next, we have philosophy, goals, and objectives of Canton Leisure Services. They have a township mission that to provide res responsive and efficient service to the Canton community, and they want our employees to be proactive in their approach, creative in your thinking, innovative in your solutions, always being fair and honest, and committed to being in a quality work environment so that we have good quality of life for our community. The department vision is the Canton Leisure Services will continue to strive for excellence in providing nationally recognized services, distinct spaces for recreation and wellness opportunities, that reflect our unique and diverse community. Our department brand line for Canton Leisure Services is that we are creating great experiences. And we strive to do that every single day. 
Core values include teamwork, integrity, professionalism, excellence, and courage. Some strategic priorities um, that we look at is we are always looking and working on strengthening operational efficiency, so making sure that we are operating the best way we can in the most efficient way. Maintaining financial stability, developing the workforce, which includes training, making sure that you are equipped with all the information you need to do your job effectively. Providing high quality services, promoting the community, and educating and informing residents. The following are some highlights of Canton Leisure Services this year. Um, for all part-time employees, the wage scale was revamped and in some cases increased. Our full-time staff no longer have unpaid furlough days. And we recently completed a five-year community survey that was done in partnership with the library. Also, the expansion of the trail system, the River Rouge Trail System, located near uh, Michigan Avenue, um, that was added in 2014. Also new, the summit launched its new Bartlett Kids Club. That's a great club for kids, uh, 12 and under. They can take part in different fitness classes and activity programs. We also continue to build our agency accreditation program. Each year, Canton Leisure Services um, strives to get reaccredited so that they are nationally recognized as a quality recreation facility. The source. Um, this is a great resource and it is a website for all Canton Township employees. On the source you will find policies, procedures, and operational management plans for your site. And you can locate the source at any time um, on the computer located in the break room. Or if you're working in the back office and you have access to the laptop, you can um, refer to the source as well. Next, we have a little diagram here that shows risk management um, as a topic. And it's cyclical, so it goes in a cycle. You're always assessing risk, planning your policies and controls, then you, you're looking for safeguards that you can implement, and then you're monitoring and evaluating those. And what this does is it protects employees and guests from injuries, illness, or any litigation. So that means they are looking out for you to make sure that you are safe and that our guests are safe. It's not just maintenance, it includes the following, the ADA or American with Disabilities Act, background checks, adequate supervision, contracts, emergency plans, inspections, and rules, guidelines, and code of conduct, and training. Next we have the Canton Township Emergency Operations Center, or EOC. And again, we see another diagram um, that's kind of in a cycle where it shows us preparing for maybe a disaster or something that could potentially happen. And if it does happen, then we are responding to that situation. And in responding to it, we deal with it and then we are recovering from the situation to resolve it. And then it reverts back to preparation again. So it goes in a cycle. In our large-scale emergency response program, our local governments are in organizations. They are the ones that are um, looking at this. It also includes annual tabletop exercises for our leadership team, and those are various people um, that work for Canton Township. CLS is also responsible for health and human services. We have a health and human service building that is located um, right near our Cherry Hill Village Theater. And the summit on the park is designated shelter location, which means um, we are recognized as a designated shelter location for the community, which means we serve as a heating center in the winter and a cooling center in the summer. If people need to take shelter, they are welcome to come here. Next we see, we have a red emergency guide that you see there, and that is part of our emergency preparedness. And inside that guide, and we have several of them um, here at the summit, and they're also at all the other Canton Leisure Service facilities. Inside, you will see general information on evacuation and shelter sites, which include information on fire, severe weather, chemical handling, and spills. Also, medical emergencies, which can include bloodborne pathogens, first aid, medical emergencies. Also, the emergency of a missing person or an armed gunman and crowd disturbance. 
Next we come to inspections, and you might not necessarily be um, involved with this, but this is just a quick overview. Inspections are conducted regularly to identify and mitigate any hazards that there might be um, within our parks, facilities, and spaces. And whenever an inspection is done, they must be documented on a, an inspection form. And it's important to remember that each inspection has specific requirement, requirements and frequency. And if you are filling out an inspection form, you only include the facts of the inspection. Do not include your opinions or thoughts. And then these will be reviewed, scanned, and saved by your supervisor. Next we come to incident reports, and some of you may be responsible for uh, filling out incident reports in your area, but this is just a general overview of what incident reports are. They are located at your facility and also on that source website. There are also separate forms for guest incidents or something that um, happens to staff. When you are filling out an incident report, um, it's very important to Remember that we fill out a report any time there is an out of an ordinary occurrence, including any injuries to a person or property, vandalism, or even conflict between guests. When you're in doubt, fill one out. Any type, anything happens, and you question, should I fill out an incident report? When you're in doubt, fill one out. If a slip, trip, or fall occurs, complete the incident report and take photos and send them so that they can be attached to the report, taking photos of the area where um, the incident occurred. And then you will turn these into your supervisor immediately. And again, not everyone's gonna be responsible for incident reports, but it's helpful to be aware of them. Next we come to evacuations. Um, in your area, every facility must have an evacuation map. And we practice evacuations at least one time per year. During large-scale events, a parking evacuation map must be prepared. We always call 911 and notify a supervisor anytime this occurs. And we only use a fire alarm during a fire emergency. So in other words, if there is an emergency, please do not use the pool station. We only use the fire alarm if there is a fire. If you are around um, one of our facilities and the fire alarm does go off, it is loud. So therefore, it can make it difficult to hear any radio or cell phone conversations. So just keep that in mind. During an evacuation, you want to sweep the facility or park or whatever area you are working at, making sure that you get everyone to a safe meeting location. And then, of course, this is considered an incident, so we would document it in an incident report. Are there any questions so far? Anyone have any questions? Next we come to fire. Um, we have to assume that all fires are real. Uh, of course, we're gonna call 911 right away. We are very fortunate here at Canton Leisure Services. Um, our police and fire are located very close and we always receive um, a quick response time. So we will conduct an evacuation sweep of our facility or area, notifying any supervised staff and we must keep minors in our care until the situation is resolved or unless a parent or guardian comes and checks the minor out. And of course, a fire is considered an incident, so therefore we will fill out an incident report. Next we come to chemical handling and a chemical spill. And for this, we have what is called SDS, or safety data sheets. And these are located in binders at each facility. And if you happen to come in contact with any chemicals, they ask you to please use PPEs, which stands for Personal Protective Equipment, and to use that any time you have contact with a chemical. You can always check the safety data sheet to find out which equipment is required for the cleanup. Now fortunately, you will not come into contact with a lot of chemicals. Um, a lot, largely that is a maintenance issue, but again, this is an over, overview of, of the um, information. When possible, avoid cleaning in direct contact with other guests or staff. And if there is a chemical spill, you're gonna secure the area around the spill and immediately notify your supervisor or staff. 
You're also going to evacuate the facility and call public safety and make sure to take any first aid equipment with you when exiting the facility. And one thing um, to note that is not listed here um, with chemicals is it's important to remember that chemicals might not necessarily be physical in something that you can see. Chemicals can also be in the air. So for example, if either you or someone comes up to you and they report that they suddenly feel sick or nauseous or dizzy or they have a headache, that too can be considered maybe um, a side effect of exposure to a chemical. So it's important to keep that in mind and um, evacuate as, as needed. Next, we're switching years. Um, we're talking about seeking shelter um, for any type of uh, emergency situation. It's important to know where the designated shelters are in your workplace. If you are inside a building or a permanent structure, preferably you would go to an interior room with no windows, such as a restroom, a locker room, it could be a storage room, an interior room, anywhere where uh, there are no windows. We always practice seeking shelter at least one time per year. It's um, a good thing to practice. If you need to seek shelter, notify your supervisor. We call 911 if emergency develops, and we always sweep our area to make sure that everyone is placed in the shelters. Getting everyone to a safe meeting location, and then afterwards, once it has been resolved and everything is okay, we would document it in an incident report. Um, here at the summit, we have um, emergency shelter maps located in each of our classrooms so that you can refer to that to kind of know where um, to go if needed. So next we come to severe weather. Uh, this time of the year, um, we may have severe weather in our area. If you are indoors, the venue safety is, if there is a severe weather watch, um, we will post signs advising guests of impending bad weather. Um, and here at the summit, we have weather watch signs that we post around the building. Also, another good resource is using your iPhone um, to look at radar. We also receive um, emergency emails from our township emergency planner, so we know if bad weather is coming. We also here at the summit have a NOAA weather radio located up at our front desk. So we are also able to refer to that and it will send us out an alert. However, if the watch becomes upgraded to a warning, we are gonna seek shelter in an interior room. Um, again, in an interior room with no windows. And you're advised, you know, if needed, crouch down, cover your head and neck until the storm has passed. And there are some pictures there of um, severe weather. So just always be aware, um, whether you're indoors or outdoors, be aware of, of the weather going on around you. So if you're outdoors, um, which a lot of you will be with the kids this summer, um, you need to keep in mind the following for outdoor venue safety. If it's winter time and it's severely cold out, you gotta remember to wear appropriate clothing, staying dry and warm. If you are using a township vehicle or driving, keep in mind to um, remember defensive driving. In the summertime, when it's hot, if we have severe heat, remember to stay hydrated, wearing sunscreen, and staying in shaded areas whenever possible. If you are outdoors and a storm approaches, when possible, Find shelter in an, an interior or permanent building. Wherever you are, be aware of where you could possibly take shelter at a moment's notice. If a tornado is present, get out of your vehicle if you were in a car, and you'll go to a low-lying area covering your head and neck until a storm has passed. If your park or facility has a ThorGuard lightning detection system, it will have designated procedures of, of what to do. Next, we come to first aid, and here we have a few um, pictures that um, show examples of first aid being given. If uh, there is an injury or illness that is not severe enough to call EMS, we will do the following. Check the scene for safety, notify your first aid or CPR trained staff, and here at the summit, um, our aquatic staff is the most highly trained CPR and first aid staff that we have. 
so we would contact Aquatics immediately. Provide care to the extent that you are trained and comfortable with. Wearing your personal protective equipment, such as latex gloves, when needed. Washing your hands afterwards. Then, if you're present, you'll make the person comfortable and secure the area around the victim. Some, either you or another coworker could notify a family member of the incident and document it in an incident report. And of course, we will notify a supervisor of what occurred. However, if it becomes a medical emergency where we do, if something happens severe enough to require EMS, you, the person needing EMS may show the following. They might be either unconscious, they might not have a pulse, they may have difficult breathing, choking, they might be bleeding, they might be in shock, having a seizure or an allergic reaction, or they might have a possible head injury or concussion or another type of serious injury. If this were to occur, we immediately check the scene for safety and we call 911 immediately. If it's something very serious, we call 911 first, then we call staff that are the most highly trained. Providing care to the extent that you are trained, wearing your uh, personal protective equipment, making sure you're washing your hands, and then make the person comfortable and secure the area around them so that there's no gawkers. You might have to help out with crowd control. And then you would notify a family member and we would document the incident in an incident report and a supervisor would be notified. Next we come to work-related injuries. So this would involve you if you happen to be injured while on the job. We would call 911, of course, for all life-threatening or serious injuries. Or you may choose, if it's a less um, serious injury, you may choose to go to Business Health Solutions. They are the provider clinics for all non-emergencies. Uh, their information is located on the source as well as in the break room. We have um, their locations posted for reference. Any minor who is a person under 18 as an employee who is being treated for a work-related injury or illness must be accompanied by a parent or legal guardian because they are a minor. And they will also be required to take an authorization to treat form. So if you are injured on the job, there is an authorized to treat form that you must take with you to the clinic before you leave your uh, work area. However, if a parent or legal guardian is not available and you are dealing with a minor aged injury, the following is the order of preference um, in dealing with the minors. The minor must be accompanied by a parent or a same-sex or gendered supervisor. Or a minor may be, if that is not available, then the minor, minor aged employee would have to be accompanied by any supervisor who is older than 18. Does anyone have any questions about that? It's, it's, it's important because some people that you might be working with might be under the age of 18 and some might be over the age of 18. When a situation requires a supervisor to accompany the minor, the legal guardian or the parent must be notified. And, and that's our policy you know, straight across the board. Anytime something happens to either an employee or a guest or child under the age of 18, their parent or guardian must be notified prior to the minor being brought to the clinic for treatment. And the authorization to treat forms can be found on the source under human resources and your supervisor also um, can help you out with that as well. Next we come to bloodborne pathogens and that's any um, blood substance that you may come into contact with. And the following is some uh, information about preventing disease transmission. Remember to always wear your PPEs, your personal protective equipment. And those can include latex gloves. Um, there are also equipment such as face shields and protective aprons. Um, however, our maintenance staff um, mainly deals with face shields and the aprons, and they um, know where those items are located. Always make sure with bloodborne pathogens that you are following proper cleanup and disposal. 
Here at the summit and in all the facilities, we have what is called red biohazard bags, where if you are doing a cleanup of any blood substance, you have to put all the soiled material in the biohazard bag, seal it up, and then it goes into a um, biohazard container that we have in our boiler room that's here at the summit. And then we also have another type of disposal for bloodborne pathogens, and that is sharps, or people that use needles. They may be diabetic or have some other sort of medical situation where, that requires them to use needles, and they need to dispose of that. Um, so handling and disposing of sharps, um, contact your supervisor if you happen to notice a needle or need assistance in disposing of one that you might find. Um, we do not have any sharps containers in any of our restrooms or locker rooms for safety purposes. So just, if you do come in contact with that or see that, just contact your supervisor or maintenance and they can assist with that. Michigan concussion laws. This is kind of in relation to head injuries. New laws in uh, 2013 now require that all coaches and supervisors of any competition style athletic programming are required to be trained in concussion recognition, such as sports teams and practices. So this information is just an FYI to you, but just know that if, if all of our sports and uh, sports coaches um, have to be trained in that. So that includes any trained coaches and staff, and there are waivers that must be signed. And if in a sports setting a concussion is suspected, um, the player will be removed from the activity, and they will have a medical evaluation, and then they must obtain written permission to return to that sport from their doctor before they can resume that sporting activity. Here at Canton Leisure Services, we have a strict policy for head injuries. We call 911. No matter how major or minor you think the head injury might be, um, no exceptions, we call 911 each and every time. Even if the person says, oh, I'm, I'm fine, I'm okay. It doesn't cost anything. We have 911 come out and evaluate them, and that's the safest course of action to take. So keep that in mind, that's important. Next we come to missing uh, people. And keep in mind, a missing person, we generally tend to think of missing people as being young children. Um, they can actually be people of any age. Um, it can't leisure services, a lot of our facilities, we have an older population. So just keep that in mind, that missing people can be people of all ages. Um, if someone is reported missing, uh, what we do immediately is contact public safety first, so that they can respond. If a person is reporting someone missing to you, it's important to keep that person reporting it with you so that they can meet public safety when they arrive. And we also have to provide details to the dispatcher. When we are calling public safety, we have to provide details such as the description of the person, how long they've been missing, and where they were last seen. Those are important things to know in finding that person. We will then notify a supervisor and other staff, and we will do an initial sweep of the area in an effort to find the person. And then once Canton Public Safety arrives, we will follow their instructions. They take the lead on the investigation, and we let them know what areas we have cleared, and then we will follow their direction from there. Care of minors at our parks, facilities, and programs. And minors, as we know, are all children uh, through the age of birth through 17 years of age, so anyone under the age of 18. We are responsible for the direct supervision of minors when they are in our care at our parks, facilities, or programs. And this would include classes, programs, and camps. Be aware of your facility's current rules regarding supervision of minors. During emergencies, we are responsible for the caring of minors until their parents or guardians can check the child out of the program. And then if you were doing a trip um, with the kids, uh, the trip event procedure and checklist 
Um, information is listed for that. The current Canton Leisure Service procedure must be followed every time a change of venue occurs for your event during the course of the program. And this may include moving from indoors to out or another site or location. So in other words, they're saying if you're taking a trip but then you have to change the location or the place, there is a specific procedure and checklist that must be followed. So just um, contact your supervisor for that. They will train you in that. Next we come to workplace violence. Um, keep in mind that workplace violence can happen between anybody. It can be a coworker or a coworker and a family member or a spouse or a friend or even a customer. Um, we can um, get workplace violence anytime, anywhere. So in identifying potential problems, if you notice this in people, um, this is the thing to look out for. If you see anyone that has increased anger, frustration, agitation, uh, they're fearing for their safety or they're complaining about their work or personal life. If someone appears or reports that they're being bullied or threatened, if you receive that information, it's important to follow your gut about potential hazards or dangerous situations. And if you know or suspect that workplace violence could occur, you notify a supervisor or human resources immediately. If for whatever reason you're not comfortable approaching your supervisor, you can also go to the human resource department and that will remain confidential. And do that immediately. And don't, don't wait on that. Don't wait thinking it may be nothing because even minor things can escalate quickly. And then finally, it says, if workplace violence occurs, you can do one of three things in that moment. You can either choose to run from the violence, you can choose to hide from the violence, or as a last resort, you can fight the violence. It, your decision is gonna depend on the situation. Along with the, vi the violence, we come to armed gunmen and crowd disturbance, uh, which we know could turn violent. If there is an immediate threat, again, in the moment, there are no right or wrong ways to um, respond to this. In the moment, you are going to choose to do, do one of three things. You're going to choose to either run, choose to hide, or choose to fight as a last resort. Um, if you see an armed gunman or there's a crowd disturbance that's escalating, Notify staff of the situation, call 911. If it's safe to do so, help other people getting to a safe location. Um, in some situations, you might be on your own. It might be every person for themselves. But if you're able to assist other people, please do so. And then we also have related to this the Michigan Open Carry Law. And that refers to firearms and the use of firearms. Um, people may carry uh, legal gun permits to carry their firearms on their person. And the Michigan Open Carry Law states that people are allowed to do that. They are allowed to carry their firearm in a holster on them at any time. If you see someone, either a guest, a customer, that is carrying a firearm, um, you can choose to call public safety and, and report it in a discreet manner. Um, if you do, it's important to keep track of that person's location. Uh, get a description of that person and where, where they are so that when public safety arrives, you can give them accurate information and location on that person. And that way, public safety will take the lead. They will approach the person and make sure that they are legally able to carry that firearm. And if they are, that's their right to do so. So that's just a simple summary of the Michigan open carry law that we have. And that can also, if you wanted more information, that can be found on the source. However, if we have a crowd disturbance, um, we don't advise employees to break up a fight. Um, remain out of it, notify staff of the situation, call 911 if it's something that you feel is threatening or is escalating. And Take the role of maybe a crowd controller. Try to minimize the number of bystanders if you can. Because we know that if there's a disturbance, people tend to try to gather and, and sometimes that can potentially create problems. Next we come to a different type of emergency um, known as a bomb threat. Fortunately, these do not happen very often, um, but it's always a possibility. 
It's important to remain calm. Um, if you receive a bomb threat on any of our township phones, we have an ATF checklist located underneath our phones at all of the Canton Leisure Service community um, phones. So if you answer one of our CLS phones and there is a bomb threat, keep the caller talking as long as possible. Get the details, any kind of background noise, anything that you can um, decipher from them and record that information down. Uh, you're going to notify 911 or a supervisor. If you're alone, um, try to call 911. If you're around other people, try to motion them, other people, for help with this, such as you can write the word bomb threat on a piece of paper and pass it to a coworker, alerting them of the situation. Then, um, the next step is we discontinue use of two-way radios. So we operate with radios here at uh, Leisure Services. So you want to try and turn all of your radios off, and also um, cell phones, um, which can be a challenging thing to do. And the reason why we try to discourage cell phone use is because, depending on the situation and type of bomb, they can sometimes be detonated through cell phones. So. If at all possible, we try to discontinue all radio and cell phone use uh, when this emergency occurs. And then once public safety arrives, they take the lead. Chances are we're going to evacuate, and we just follow the instructions um, that the police give us. Does anyone have any questions at all? Next, we come to lockout tagout, and that might not be familiar um, to a lot of you. Um, basically what it is, it's a device that maintenance or staff will put on any damaged or broken energy source, such as an outlet plug or um, a piece of fitness equipment. Any type of energy source, if there's a problem with it and it is no longer operational, we must lock out and tag out. Make sure that staff and guests are aware that that particular device cannot be used. And we always notify maintenance that the device needs to be repaired. So your best judgment would be to notify maintenance anytime um, there's a problem with an energy source, such as an outlet plug, a computer, um, any type of electrical device. And then, of course, this is an incident, so we are going to you know, document it on, on what occurred and what lockout, tagout equipment was used. Again, chances are this is not something you're going to have to um, deal with or have exposure to, but it's just a general FYI and overview, something good to be aware of. Next, we come to a topic um, of evidence in, in referring to an emergency situation. Items that could be the sign of a crime are used in an investigation. So if, you were, if something, an incident were to occur and there are evid there's evidence present, you always get a witness take a picture of it, document it in an incident report, and then store all of that in a safe location, and then call, contact public safety to come pick it up. Um, if you find something such as a firearm, drugs, um, soiled clothing, do not touch it. Um, it might ruin the integrity of the evidence. We call public safety immediately um, to deal with that. If it is evidence um, in the case of abuse, such as sexual, verbal, or assault abuse, we always contact public safety. And if that is reported to you, you are considered a witness, so you would be part of um, the investigation. And it's good to be a good witness and help out with that. The next, we come to customer service. Just uh, switching gears here from emergency to what we can do to offer good customer service to um, all of our um, customers. The 510 rule. Chances are you've heard of the 510 rule. It just means that every time you pass someone within 10 feet of you, you're going to acknowledge them. We're not going to be on our iPhones. We're going to acknowledge them. We're going to make eye contact, passing someone in the hall, nodding and smiling at them. And then if you become even closer with someone in passing, say within five feet, greet them. Say, hey, how are you? Good morning, good afternoon. How can I help you? Um, it's good to be observant, especially if someone's in your area and they look like they may be lost 
Um, it's good, you know, just to approach them and say, how can I help you? That's a good five foot rule. Show that you genuinely care about what, what the other person has to say. Because their interaction with you as a Canton Leisure Service employee is a reflection of how they feel about Canton Leisure Services. We are representatives of um, the community that we work in. So, for example, if you're asking someone, how are you doing today, make sure that you like, listen to their response and maybe respond back. Just some basic customer service 101. Next, we come to handling conflict. Um, conflict resolution rules. Agree to resolve the conflict. That, the following is what people that are in conflict must do. They must agree to resolve it. So if you are playing middleman to two people that are in conflict, you're going to have them take turns talking, making sure that they're not interrupting each other. And this is important information because dealing with young children that you will be doing um, in your jobs, there will be conflict. So you have to make sure that you allow the kids to take turns talking, make sure that they don't interrupt each other, make sure that people are being truthful about what is bothering them and that they state it clearly. It's important to listen to the other person. Be sure that you understand what they are saying and understand the problem from their point of view. And then finally, being willing to compromise. That's, that's on the road to handling conflict. That's the end result, compromising. So next we come to promoting Canton Leisure Services. As an employee, it's important to, at all times, be professional. Looking, acting, and sounding um, professional. Know what is going on throughout your department. Um, be knowledgeable, not only of what area you work in, but what is going on around you. Try to anticipate what the guest is looking for. And then provide guests with resources. If someone approaches you with a question, you can do many things. You can refer them to our website, www.cantonfund.org. You can give them a copy of the Discover brochure. Or you can refer them to social media. Canton Leisure Services is on Facebook, so we can always refer them um, to that source as well. Next, we come to the American with Disabilities Act, also known as ADA for short. So we have an ADA law, and in all of our facilities, um, we have several ADA um, things that we have, like such, for example, at the summit, we have automatic doors, we have chair lifts in our aquatic center, things like that. So accessibility to all facilities and programs is the bare minimum, such as I've just mentioned. However, the legal requirement is the following. Walkways and paths need to be at least 36 inches wide at all spaces. There is a place called Universal Design, and they're taking the law a step further. They're trying to make the spaces even more accessible. So they want to make it so it, pathways are at least 72 inches uh, wide so that two people can pass or go together. So those are examples of reasonable accommodations. Now, if you are approached by someone um, that notices that they have a special request um, an ADA request, what should you do? You will have them complete the ADA accommodation request form, making sure that the request and the contact name and phone number are clear. Thank them for their interest and assistance in completing the form. And this is something that your supervisor might do as well. We inform them that someone from Leisure Services will contact them soon. And then that person will follow up with them to make sure, yes, we can accommodate your request or no, we cannot. And the ADA accommodation request forms are located on the source. So again, this is something that you may rarely have to deal with, something that might rarely occur, but the source is going to be your best bet um, for that information. It's just an FYI, good information to know. Care, work-life solutions. 
Um, this is for us as Canton Leisure Service employees. You may notice um, in the break room when you're clocking in and out, there are some literature that is posted in there by Work Life Solutions. And they offer free and confidential assistance for all Canton employees and their families. Human Resources only gets a report of the number of uses. They're never told the names of the people who contact them. So if you are ever, you or a family member are ever in need of uh, confidential assistance or counseling, be assured that it will remain confidential uh, by Human Resources. Counselors are available 24 hours a day, and they have the 800 number there listed. And again, the work-life solutions, that can be found in the source, and it's also posted in the break room, regular literature for this. There are also websites with resources on managing stress, financial management, dealing with trauma, and they offer various webinars. And right there is listed their website at www.powerflexweb.com, and it gives you a password as well. That information, again, will be um, located on the source website if you need it. Policy awareness. All township and Canton Leisure Service policies can be found on the source. Your division's operations manual is located in the computer, and your supervisor has all that information. But just know that each and every employee must undergo a background check. It's done annually on part-time employees, contractors, and volunteers that are assigned to work with minors. You may need to have a driver's license check. If you are required, if you are authorized to drive a township vehicle, if that is listed as part of your job description. And then Canton Leisure Services is a drug-free workplace. All part-time seasonal employees are a part of the Canton Township Random Drug and Alcohol Test Program. If you are selected, staff will be notified to report to their testing site. However, failure to participate in the random test will dr directly result in termination. Narcotics, and this would include anything, um, prescription drugs, anything like that. Canton Leisure Service policy is that you shall not store or bring in, into any Canton facility or Canton vehicle any controlled substance or narcotics, even if they are prescribed. If necessary, leave them in your vehicle and notify your supervisor that you, know, you need to take that and they will um, work with you um, moving forward on that. Questions or comments? In the future, if you have a question about how to handle a particular situation, contact your supervisor immediately. They are, they are your resource for any assistance that you might need. And then here we have a, a photo collage of a lot of our Canton Leisure Service programs and sports, different things um, that we enjoy doing um, with the kids each year. Some of you might even notice your picture up there especially if you're a long-time employee. And then this last slide that we have here is everything that I have covered in the presentation tonight. And each of you um, have or will receive a copy of this, and we will need you to sign and date it, um, just stating that you have completed and reviewed all of this information. And that will be submitted to your supervisor. Okay, that concludes, I'm sorry we didn't take our break, I'm just kind of going at a good clip there. Yeah, this, nope, this concludes our, um, our presentation of all the emergency departments. <laughs>